production of Kansas City Week in Review is made possible through the generous support of Dave and Jamie Cummings, Smithfield Foods, Haas and Wilkerson Insurance, and by viewers like you. Thank you. The nation and a new management, but what does it mean for our metro? Missouri learning what a new leader means as its governor takes an ax to state services. Plus Kansas City going to pot as marijuana is added to the April ballot. Also this week, the Missouri Supreme Court forcing the city to put a $15 minimum wage on the ballot. One of the plaza's longest tenants shuttering its doors. And is there trouble brewing in OP? Hello, I'm Nick Haynes, and welcome to the program that connects the dots on your local news on both sides of the state line. Tracking those stories with us this week, the host of Up to Date on KCUR-FM, Steve Kraske. Dissecting the news from behind the microphone at KCMO Talk Radio, Mike Ferguson. From 41 Action News, anchor and reporter Dear Wall. And from the pages of your Kansas City star, Dave Helling. Now, as we record this program this Friday, much of the world is fixated on one man, the new leader in charge of the United States, Donald Trump. Many of the sights and sounds of Inauguration Day are playing out as we sit around the cozy confines of our Week in Review table. But, Steve, there are a million places you can hear about what's happening in Washington. We're always interested here in the local tentacles of the big events in the news. Did I read correctly that Missouri Senator Roy Blunt was in charge of planning the whole inauguration events we're seeing today? He is large and in charge uh, today, <laughs> Nick, because he is chairman of the, something called the Senate Rules Committee, and it so happens that that position uh, is given the responsibility of staging this inauguration everybody's watching today. What's the biggest local figure that has the biggest influence in this inauguration today, uh, Dave? Well, I think Roy Blunt is a, is a good call. I mean, I'm not... There, there isn't, in terms of the ceremony itself, a great deal of Kansas or Missouri involvement other than people will show up. Mike Pompeo has been appointed to be the CIA director. He'll be there and, and other figures. And by the way, Bob Dole was on the yes, dais today. Before we came over, I had a chance to watch some of the ceremonies and Bob Dole was there. So there is a bit of a connection, but not overwhelming one. And, and Sam Brownback and the new Missouri governor, Eric Greitens, also there. Mike? That's correct. Yeah, I mean, uh, I think uh, when you first read off the question, a lot of people just said, well, Chris Kobach was trying to have a big influence, but I agree. Roy Blunt, uh, his quietly huge influence on this. You know, what impact will this presidency have on our region? This week, Trump dispatched the vice president-elect Mike Pence to speak to the U.S. Conference of Mayors to promise he will be a friend to city mayors and spend huge amounts of money on their infrastructure needs. In addition to urging me to send along greetings, he said, Tell them we're going to do an infrastructure bill, and it's going to be big. This administration is going to be committed to work with Republican and Democrat mayors across America on an equal footing. No politics. Just results. So what does that mean for our metro then, Steve? Well, that's a good way to cozy up to mayors across the country, Nick, so many of whom are struggling with infrastructure, including Kansas City Mayor Sly James. Of course, an $800 million bond package now in the offing. Voters will be considering that in April. So infrastructure, that's a huge thing. It's going to make a lot of mayors very happy, Nick. Yeah, but we cannot forget that the president of the United States is just one player in this drama. Of course. And Congress is controlled by Republicans, and their enthusiasm for a major infrastructure package is yet to be made clear, not only in terms of the spending, Nick, but how it's going to get paid for. Uh, the, the Republicans just passed a budget resolution that adds $9 trillion to the debt over the next 10 years. The idea that somehow they're suddenly going to pour hundreds of million dollars into the city seems a bit problematic. No matter what the president uh, decides to do, that's something to keep our eyes on. And one thing also to remember is that Donald Trump is uh, saying he wants to cut the size of the federal government. So another impact on Kansas City could be fewer federal workers over the next few years if he gets anywhere close to his wish on that. Now, one impact of a new administration is what happens with the Affordable Care Act, more commonly known as Obamacare. Dia, you've been reporting on that this week. Can we just take a quick look, an excerpt from one of your reports this week on that? It's dinner time in the Fuller family's Brookside home. Dad Stephen walking in the door. Shoes off. Sanitizer on. The daily reality. Okay. Since their 14 month old son, Emerson, has cystic fibrosis. And it wasn't until later that we started realizing that it's not only 
fatal, but it's also really, really expensive. Emerson takes five medications a day, more than $1,000 a month, paid for by insurance through the Affordable Care Act. It's so necessary, it's so vital um, for families like ours, families that have pre-existing conditions or long-term serious health needs. Swope Health Services has enrolled more than 18,000 people since the initial rollout. Many of them like the Fullers. Honestly, um, the majority of the people that we enroll are working class people. Okay, that was just a snapshot of a much bigger report that you did on that this week. But, dear, what is the anxiety level then at Swope Park about what happens now with the Affordable Care Act? Swope Park is actually pretty calm. It's business as usual for them. They were one of, if not the first, certified area here in the metro for people to get enrolled in the ACA when it was rolled out. I think most of the anxiety that people are feeling and that's being talked about around the country is with families like the Fullers. Although the president has promised to keep the provision for families that have pre-existing conditions to make sure they don't get dropped from coverage, and has also vowed to keep the provision that lets kids stay on their parents' insurance until they're 26. Now, we saw a report this week saying about 18 million Americans were going to be kicked off of the Affordable Care Act in the first year alone. In your report, in the more extensive report, you talk about Republicans saying that's just scare tactics. That's not going to happen. Right. The Congressional Budget Office came out with an estimate, and they took three metrics. One of them was taking out the money for Medicaid expansion, taking out tax penalties for the uninsured, and then another one was, gosh, subsidies for low-income families who want to get private insurance. When they did that, in the first year, 18 million people lost their coverage. By year 10, that number had grown to 32 million. Republicans have been saying that's not going to happen, but the challenge here is the marching order has always been repeal Obamacare and then replace it. A lot of talk about the repeal, but no plan for what it will be replaced with has been proposed or analyzed yet. And the truth is, we don't know what's going to happen, do we, Steve? No, this is a matter of cart, horse, horse, cart, Nick. Again, repealing Obamacare very much in the minds of Republican lawmakers. So many Americans eager to know what's going to replace it. You can make a case that maybe that argument should have come first before all the talk about repealing. Well, the change in the discussion over the past eight years has not been should the federal government be involved in providing your health care, but we've now just accepted that overall, not necessarily necessarily conservatives. And so now it's going to be what plan is it that's going to do it? And keep in mind, a lot of people were complaining that, hey, because of Obamacare, my premiums went up. And so the family that you just saw, you know, that's what a lot of the focus is. But there are so many people who are saying, I want my premiums to go back down. If it went up with Obamacare, doesn't it stand to reason it'll go down without it? Mm -hmm. uh, before we leave this topic of the inauguration and the local tentacles, I should point out that on Saturday, more than 2,000 women are expected to gather at Washington Park downtown. For the Women's March in Kansas City, organizers are going out of their way to say this is not an anti-Trump rally. So why are they holding this on the weekend of his inauguration? Because it's an anti-Trump rally. <laughs> That's the bottom line. It really is. When you look, and I take that from their own uh, their own uh, description of the event. And uh, when you read uh, the list of speakers and what they are going to speak about, the interesting thing for me, just to, from a political observation standpoint, is it looks like they're going to double down on all the things that got them beat in Middle America, as far as uh, gun control, as far as gay rights, as far as Obamacare, uh, as far as immigration, as far as uh, religion. Uh, they're basically just going to double down on what got him whooped in November. Well, that, by the way, that rally takes place at 1 p.m. at Washington Park downtown. We've heard plenty about budget woes in Kansas, but the New York Times reporting this week that two-thirds of all states are facing a budget crunch and expected shortfalls, including Missouri. Barely settled into the new job. New Governor Eric Greitens wielded the budget acts this week, cutting $146 million from the state budget because of lower-than-expected revenues and a poor state economy. The money's just not in our bank account. His plan spared some areas. We are not taking a single penny out of our K through 12 Perfect. classrooms. But Greitens cut almost nine million in busing aid for K through 12 and slashed 76 million from higher education. This is a, a tough choice that we had to make. Oh, that's a familiar voice. Oh, it was Dia Wall. You had an exclusive interview with the governor this week, sitting down extensively with him. But why higher education? Of all the areas that he could be cutting, why did he say higher education was taking most of the cuts here? Greitens says it reflects the priorities of the people who elected him. He wants to protect public safety. He wants to protect the dollars in the K-12 through classrooms. And I think a lot of... I mean, politicians across the country look at higher ed as an easy place to go in and cut. His staff did tell me, though, that they looked at funding sources for the places that were cut, so they have alternative forms of funding, so no one should be 
getting shut down. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, the MU system is an easy target, particularly for conservatives, because the MU system right now is not making a clear and convincing case that they are worth the investment, that there's an ROI, especially when you go back to all the protests and everything that's happened on the campuses right now. So I think it's just an easy target. Steve, you know, it's amazing to me, and I should point out, Nick, that I draw a salary from the MU system. I teach journalism at UMKC. So you're going to approve completely <laughs> of those cuts to higher education. Now, that's it's very, very charitable of you. When I first began covering state government out here in the heartland back in the 1980s, you know, higher education was seen as something kind of sacred, something kind of special, off limits to cuts. These days, the thinking is completely different, uh, completely uh, morphed into this notion that higher education is the purview of, of, of elites, that people who go to a, a college should pay their own way, it's pay as you go. The thinking has completely flipped in the last 25 years, Nick. Last week on this very program, we talked about the new governor and uh, the, the opportunities in terms of uh, stadium subsidies and what it would mean to the sports complex and whether he would continue subsidies. There's concern about the UMKC Conservatory of Music and Dance that wants to have a downtown campus. They're relying on state matching funds. Might that not happen under Eric Greitens? Well, it might not happen under Eric Greitens, uh, particularly given the state's budget problems. There is some suggestion, if you talk to folks at UMKC, that maybe they don't need the, the entire $48 million immediately. They have 48 million of their own privately, and so they could get going, and maybe some commitment from the state of five, six million dollars at least get you down the road. And there is some indication that might happen. I mean, it's not an enormous amount of money in the context of the budget, and there is a state commitment to do so. But the sim symbolism of spending that kind of public money on a campus is very high. The Greitens people are all about symbolism, particularly now. Uh, and so I think it's in more danger than maybe local people understand. We all come with impressions of people. You had the opportunity, as I mentioned earlier, to sit down and do a very extensive interview with the new governor this week, Thea, on Channel 41 Action News. Did your impressions change having met him? No. I don't think he said anything that surprises you. I don't think he said anything that's out of the box. He's a well-oiled machine. He is timely. He walked in the door on time. Really just a high-energy guy. I think you knew where he stood on right to work. Budget cuts are never popular. They're like taxes, right? Nobody wants to be at the receiving end of them. Um, one thing I did learn that I thought was pretty interesting, First Lady Sheena Greitens is going to be taking up adoption and foster care services as one of her platforms as First Lady, so we can look forward to that. Um, the governor also plans to come to Kansas City in the coming months to do a community walk with leaders here in some of the urban areas, so that should be interesting, something I've, to watch. I've done a couple of Missouri Viewpoints uh, segments on adoption and foster care, and there are over 10,000 children in the foster care system right now looking for parents, so just to bring that up, that's a very worthy cause. Next up, going to pot in Kansas City. Despite what they described as grave reservations, the Kansas City Council puts on the April ballot a measure reducing punishment for marijuana possession. What would this measure actually do? It would uh, reduce the fine for 35 grams or less, which, as my listeners told me uh, yesterday, is a, still a lot of pot. It makes me wonder a little bit about a few of them. But uh, it means that the maximum <laughs> fine would be $25. And the big thing is, is that there would not be a felony record uh, and uh, there would be no risk of jail time. Assuming that the prosecution only happens in Kansas City, the state could still do it at once. So what were these grave reservations that the council had? And if there were so many grave reservations, why was it still put on the ballot? Well, because some council members are worried that people who can't afford a lawyer th will think they can plead guilty and just get by with a $25 fine, when in fact that conviction then, the resulting conviction, will show up on their permanent records. That could undermine well, that their... will be there forever. And Still, that undermine okay. your prospects for jobs and everything else, Nick. Okay. Now, pot won't be the only question on the Kansas City ballot in April. So will potholes, pavements, and puppies. The city council <laughs> putting aside disagreements this week to place on the April 4th ballot an $800 million infrastructure measure. You will now be deciding three separate questions, one to repair streets, bridges, and sidewalks, another for flood control, and a third for a new animal shelter and renovation of public buildings to comply with the Americans with Disabilities Act. Dave, I, I'm still unclear as to why it was considered wise to have three separate questions on this. Why not just have well, one question? Uh, Do you want infrastructure or not? Yeah, it's not necessarily wise. It's required, or at least the council was told it was required because of uh, bond covenants and other 
technical legal reasons you needed to split the uh, split the question up as a political matter for the public as it expresses its preferences at the polls, Nick. Uh, <laughs> will uh, And for those paying attention, I was alliterating as well. The, um, <laughs> the, uh, 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 the, the question will be uh, uh, more difficult to wade through. And there is a chance you'll vote yes on one, no on the others. You may decide sidewalks and streets are more important than... But all three have to pass to get the bond issue through. Uh, is that correct? I'm not sure. I think that that's right. We'll, yeah. we'll see. I mean, if it, okay, it may well, be that... Here's another question. Why is it then, and, and in your story on this, it says it requires 57% of votes, voters to approve. Mm -hmm. Why 57% well, of actually, voters? Well, actually, it goes up in other elections, Nick, because... Uh, under Missouri law, there are super majorities required when you issue some general obligation okay. bonds that this would be. And, it's, in essence, borrowing, and the state wants to make sure that an, a super majority wants to borrow before it does. This is the only election during the course of a year w where the threshold's 57 percent. It's for municipal elections under state law. That was sort of a, a nod to cities that need to pass these things. Other elections, Nick, two-thirds support can, required. Can I just say quickly, my confusion about the three questions is the public's confusion That's in right. a way mm -hmm. and That's the right. public's confusion over the uh, pushing and shoving. I wrote a column on this the pushing and shoving over the ballot measure that finally passed on Thursday is also a political problem and when the with 90 days to go I mean the election is not that far away when you have in essence a huge public uh, bond issue coupled with a tax increase I mean, this isn't a uh, revenue neutral. You're going to have to pay more. But, but it's was, a difficult thing to get through. But the concern was a lack of specificity, a lot more specificity right. of what types of projects would be funded, what type of roads would get paved, et cetera, or were provided by the council this week. So doesn't that take away from a lot of those objections, Mike? Um, sort of. I mean, at the very last minute, they're still wrangling over how are we going to spend this $800 million. They made up their mind. They wanted to spend $800 million. Oh, my goodness, the clock is running out. Let's figure out how to spend it. First of all, that's bad government, even though the predicament the city is in and is not this mayor or council's fault in particular. But, uh, yeah, there's, there are more details that need to be sold over a short time. This wasn't managed all that well. Going up to the wire on this thing, to, to get this on the April ballot, uh, raised a lot of questions in people's minds. Let's give them a little bit of credit, though. As this, this, this drama ends, the council appears unified. Quentin Lucas saying, I'm in love with this plan. He's been a critic of it. There is some specificity built into this thing. The wrangling might fade away a little bit here. Proponents think they've got a shot, although it's a slim one, to get this thing passed. Now, I should also point out that also this week, the Missouri Supreme Court ordering Kansas City to put a $15 an hour minimum wage proposal on the ballot. The high court was reversing a lower court ruling that said state law prohibited the city from adopting a minimum wage different from the state's basic wage, which is $7.70. But the city declines to add it to the April ballot, saying they'd prefer an August election. Are they worried in doing that, that if it went on the April ballot election, it would hurt the infrastructure election? Or was well, there some I think other that's a minor here? part of it, and um, the other part of it is they didn't have really a lot of time okay. to consider, uh, you know, how it might impact the April ballot. But again, Nick, politically, look at the message this sends. In April, you'll be asked to pay higher property taxes and higher sales taxes. We're, in essence, taking money out of your pocket. But this proposal to put more money in your pocket, nah, we're not interested in that. We want to put that off to August. I'm telling you, as a, as a uh, political matter, selling this to the public is going to be difficult. One business that will definitely not have to pay its workers the $15 minimum wage is Houston's on the Country Club Plaza. <laughs> After 30 years, it's now shuttering its doors. Dia, you've been reporting on this story this week. Is this just the normal evolution of a restaurant chain, or is there something else happening with the new owners of the Country Club Plaza that we need to be aware of? The short answer, it's normal. Okay. Churn and burn on the Country Club Plaza has happened since the beginning of time when it was created. I got to talk to Monroe Dodd, who was fabulous, and he really schooled me on the history, right? It was, I mean, there was a post office there. There was a five and dime. This was like a regular place to go, they mail a letter. Some of that. You stop it, get <laughs> some dry cleaning office. done. <laughs> and after the flood of 77 of Brush Creek, they said, well, let's make it upscale. And it's been evolving ever since. I think talking to people, some of the folks out there, 
This one stings a little bit because yes. Houston's has been there for 30 years. Um, yeah. I think that the halls of the world and some of the other, you know, really big names that have moved out sting because they're either local, it's nostalgia, or they've been there a long time. But it was called Houston's because it was a Texas-based chain. Yes, yes. And um, I can report, based on my Twitter feed, the Hawaiian ribeye seems to be the favorite. <laughs> you, you better get that soon because uh, when is it closing? Not immediately. March 31st. But what's interesting is the plaza looks like they want to still keep talking. They want to keep having those negotiations to see if management will change their mind. It sounds like there was an infrastructure improvement that would have forced them to shut down temporarily so they couldn't come to terms. Well, he's led Johnson County's largest city for the past decade, but Overland Park Mayor Carl Gerlach has never faced an opponent for re-election until now. Former state lawmaker Charlotte O'Hara has announced she's running against Gerlach for a job that pays $32,000 a year. What did Gerlach do that was so terribly wrong? Is the fencing too high around Top Golf? Is it the new $2 charge to go to the farmstead or the $3 now the city's charging to go to the Arboretum? Charlotte has run for many things and uh, sometimes successfully, sometimes unsuccessfully. I think this is just another attempt on her part to inject herself into the local political scene. And we'll see, you know, mayors can upset some neighborhoods and we'll see what the support is for Carl Garland. You know, she's very concerned about development incentives in Overland Park. She thinks there's been too many of them over the years. Having said that, Carl Gerlach has been, uh, won his last two races unopposed, Nick. He's a fairly popular figure in Overland Park. She faces a tough battle here. And just uh, a note here, Carl Gerlach's name has been mentioned as a possible candidate for governor of Kansas next year. But isn't there a laundry list of people who want that job? I also saw this week that uh, Ed O'Malley, Ed O'Malley my former today. Uh, lawmaker, also wanted that job. You've got Chris Kobach who also wants that job. Uh, right. Lynn Jenkins, the congresswoman from uh, Topeka, will be perhaps an early front runner in that race. Jeff Collier. Jeff Collier, the lieutenant governor. It's going to be a crowded field. At least that's the way it looks today, Nick. Yes. And, and none of that's going to happen early because Sam Brownback is still the governor. Still no I hope. Uh, we've always talked about this. Still no hope of him leaving leaving the state to join the Trump administration. Again, it could happen, but they did pick a USDA secretary mm -hmm. this week from uh, Georgia, Sonny Perdue. That was one of the things that apparently the governor of Kansas was up for. As that story continues to age, it begins to have a bit of an odor. Look for ambassadorships, Nick. It could be a possibility for Governor Brownback. And how long into an administration does that happen, though? Well, there's lots of seat positions that remain unfilled. I think even for the next couple months, we could expect uh, uh, the possibility. Lots of, of positions, oh, most yeah. positions. Most positions. The, and just as a side note to that, the U.S. attorney in, in Western Missouri, Tammy Dickinson, is staying on the job. Uh, as a Democrat, even after the inaugural today, because they haven't picked U.S. Uh, US attorneys for this spot and the Kansas spot as well, Tom Beal. So it's pretty unusual. Right? There's yeah. a lot of Kansas Republicans who definitely want Sam Brown back out of the state. They'd probably thrilled to hear you say that the, he'd be run out of the country. Steve. <laughs> 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 All right. While we've already talked about a lot of stories this week, for many Kansas Cityans, the biggest headline was one of disappointment as the Chiefs fizzle in their playoff game at Arrowhead. Yeah, thanks. It wasn't the only thing fizzling this week. What about the ice storm that was going to paralyze the city? The story prompted star cartoonist Lee Judge to ask, do you know what can happen to boys who cry wolf? What? They grow up to be local weather forecasters? The audacity. <laughs> Dear is the official representative of every single person in commercial TV news on this program. Yes. What, what kind of beating were you taking from viewers on this story? Okay, let's just back it up. Meteorologists yes. are hardworking, intelligent people. I assure you, they don't go to work and say, how can we ruin lives for as many people as possible today? The weather service has come out and said, look, we over forecast. On Thursday, they said there's going to be this massive ice storm, yada, yada, yada. I'm happy to report 41 Action News Chief Meteorologist Gary Lezak didn't from Thursday. He said this is not going to be a big deal, hmm. but schools were closing, Good schools were shutting down. So today, we got it right. Okay. My and grocery stores really appreciated the over forecasting because <laughs> I stopped in to grab one thing and had to wait in line 20 minutes because everybody was taking eggs and milk and oatmeal and beer like it was going out of style. So there's a lot of people well stocked on, well, maybe not necessities, but a lot of stuff <laughs> from the day before the ice storm that never happened. Area school children also appreciated it because they got the day off and they could still go out because there was no sign of ice. And that's right. No complaints from kids who could stay home for an extra day, Nick. They like that kind of As stuff. We started the program looking at Missouri Governor Eric Greitens. He holds a press conference to say a state of emergency, do not leave the state. Um, how was he reviewed after that, I think Dave? he got pretty high marks for that. I mean, you, don't, you can't criticize 
uh, public officials from overreacting because you will certainly yeah. criticize them if they're not prepared. And I do think there was some showmanship and theater involved at 5 a.m. getting up and or bringing pizza to the uh, to the workers. I mean, that obviously someone who was whispering in the governor's ear, "Hey, this will look good on on television in, in the newspaper." But uh, you know, for all the criticism the weather people get and the news people get, and the, let's be fair, the star went crazy too. You, you, it's better in many ways to over prepare than under repair, right. uh, prepare. Yeah. And, and, and uh, so, in that sense, maybe we got lucky in both ends of that story. When yeah. I talked to the governor on Monday, he was very proud of the response. He said, you know, people save lives based on their actions. So, I mean, I always say, be grateful it didn't happen. Yes. Don't be hateful to the people who are trying. Hey. But what, what type of response though, do you actually get from viewers? Oh, on that? Uh, do, they, uh, do they get hateful yes, with you? Yes, of course they do. Meteorologists get it the most because <laughs> it's what impacts everybody, right? Yes. Um, we cover stories day in, day out, but that's based on one community or one city or one council. This impacts everybody. And so, yeah, people, they want to be home if they have to be home, but they want to be able to go out if they can. And you're right, the bread, the milk. Yep. <laughs> the grocery store is getting slammed. And it should be noted that uh, other parts of the state did get hit worse than we did, so the preparations, you know, came in really handy in some specific areas of the state, just not nearly as bad as they thought it was going to yeah. be. And, and better that there was no problems than that we didn't report on properly. Uh, so that is our Week in Review. Our thanks to this week's news reviewers, keeping you up to date weekdays from 11 to noon on KCUR-FM, Steve Kraske, and from 41 Action News reporter and anchor, Dear Wall, thank you for being with us. Mike Ferguson dissects the news four to six weekdays on KCMO Talk Radio, and you can find Dave Helling in the pages of your Kansas City Star, now on the editorial board, Dave. That is correct, as is Dr. Kraske, by the way. Right. Come to KCPT for the best opinions in Kansas City. All right, we <laughs> appreciate that. I'm Nick Haynes from all of us here at KCPT. Thanks for spending part of your weekend with us.